Hey guys, welcome back to our YouTube channel. It's a girl Fanny Lungu back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget to subscribe. A big shout out to everyone that has subscribed to our channel so far. Thank you for subscribing, liking, commenting, sharing everything that you guys do. We're very grateful. And a big shout out to the person that suggested this. I hope all of you guys are doing alright and may you stay blessed. So today I'm going to be reacting to the day Jesus denied he was God and let her cover up. So without wasting time, let's get into the video. I want to tell you the story of the day that Jesus denied that he was God and the subsequent cover-up. Now this is not some kind of Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown conspiracy theory. Oh no, this is based on really solid scholarship. So what is this story? Well, it's found in Mark chapter 10, Mark being our earliest gospel. Uh, the other gospel writers, Matthew and Luke, used Mark in the writing of their gospel. They amended it and added to it and so on as they saw fit. And our guide to the passage will be a chap called William Barclay. Uh, William Barclay wrote this uh, commentary on the gospel of Mark and he was, um, amongst other things, an author, a radio and television presenter, Church of Scotland minister and most importantly for our purposes, Professor of Divinity and Biblical Criticism at the University of Glasgow. And he wrote, a, he wrote this popular set of Bible commentaries on the New Testament, which has sold over one and a half million copies. Um, now, his um, motto, if you like, was, quote, making the best biblical scholarship available to the average reader. So that's why he wrote these 17 commentaries on the New Testament published by St Andrew's Press, and they're still very popular today. You can buy them in Christian bookshops and other places. He's very readable, actually, and, uh, and very accessible for the layman. So there's a story in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, I want to tell you what he says about it, and then we'll come to the cover-up. So the story in the Gospel goes, As Jesus was going along the road, a man came running to him, threw himself at his feet, and asked him, Good teacher, what am I to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? There is no one who is good except one, God. Barclay says, Here, here is one of the most vivid stories in the Gospels. We must note how the, the man came and how Jesus met him. He came running. He flung himself at Jesus' feet. There is something amazing in the sight of this rich, young aristocrat falling at the feet of the penniless prophet from Nazareth, who was on the way to being an outlaw. Good teacher, he began, and straight away Jesus answered back, No flattery. Don't call me good. Keep that word for God. It almost looks as if Jesus was trying to pour cold water on that young enthusiasm. There is a lesson here. It is clear that this man came to Jesus in a moment of overflowing emotion. It is also clear that Jesus exercised a personal fascination over him. Jesus did two things that every evangelist and every preacher and every teacher ought to remember and to copy. First, he said, in effect, stop and think. Don't get carried away by your excitement. I don't want you swept to me by a moment of emotion. Think calmly what you are doing. Jesus was not cold shouldering the man. He was telling him, even at the very outset, to count the cost. Second, he said, in effect, you cannot become a Christian by devotion to me. You must look at God. I'll just read that again. Second, he said, in effect, you cannot become a Christian by devotion to me. You must look at at God. Preaching and teaching always mean the conveying of truth through personality and thereby lies the greatest danger of the greatest teachers. The danger is that the pupil, the scholar, the young person may form a personal attachment to the teacher or preacher and think that it is an attachment to God. Teachers and preachers must never point to themselves. They must always point to God. There is in all true teaching a certain self-obliteration. True, we cannot keep personality and warm person, personal loyalty 
out of it altogether, and we would not if we could. But the matter must not stop there. Teachers and preachers are, in the, la in the last analysis, only pointers to God. End of quote. That's page 283. So, that's very interesting. Jesus is clearly denying that he is God in this passage. And as a good teacher, as a good preacher, he's pointing away from himself to true goodness, the absolute source of goodness, which is God himself. So, now, what happens now? Well, what happens now is we find in the later Gospels, who you remember use Mark, Matthew and Luke, use Mark in the writing of their Gospels, and they change, alter, embellish, edit, add, subtract, as they see fit, with great freedom to do what they wish. And when we come to Matthew's Gospel, we find, according to Professor Jimmy Dunn, uh, who is a very distinguished New Testament scholar at the University of Durham, in his book Unity and Diversity in the New Testament, an inquiry into the character of earliest Christianity. This is a heavyweight academic work, um, at least um, late undergraduate or postgraduate level. Um, and he says on page 79, we must, also, we must note also how some sayings of Jesus have been deliberately altered in the course of transmission, altered in such a way as to give a clearly different sense from the original. For example, the opening interchange between the rich young man and Jesus, Mark 10, 17, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. We've read that. In Matthew's version, chapter 19, verse 16, reads as follows. What good deed must I do to have eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Only one is good. So the words have been changed. Why do you call me good in Mark becomes why do you ask me about what is good in Matthew? So what's going on here? Why has Matthew changed the words of Mark? Uh, Jimmy Dunn says elsewhere, uh, and other scholars have said the same, to avoid the embarrassment of Jesus' denial of his divinity in Mark. This is an embarrassing saying in Mark. It leads to the inevitable conclusion, as Barclay says, that Jesus is pointing away from himself to God, God being a separate being. And the early Christians, some early Christians, didn't want that to be the conclusion that we naturally reach. So uh, they altered Jesus' words to make them more fitting for Christian belief towards the end of the first century. And in this passage, and maybe I'll do a separate video uh, on this, Jimmy Dunn gives lots of examples, other examples, of how the teaching of Jesus has been uh, changed, and we can actually witness this. This is not speculation. Uh, this is not liberal scholarship. You can, by comparing the different passages, you can see how they've been altered and what the agenda of Jesus' teaching has been changed, whether it be on divorce. Uh, if you look at Mark's teaching, uh, Mark has Jesus teaching one thing on divorce, and Matthew adds and amends it uh, in his gospel. Uh, Luke does the same on other questions to do with the resurrection appearances, and so on and so on. Uh, I won't go into all that at the moment. My point here is that we have a story where Jesus denies he is God, Later Christians uh, find that unacceptable, so they change the words of Jesus to make his words more acceptable to a later Christian faith as it changed and developed and elevated Jesus higher and higher and higher until he became, at the Council of Nicaea, uh, a God, uh, God the Son alongside God the Father. Um, this is quite shocking, and this is totally mainstream scholarship. Um, it's one of the things that rocks your faith. When you go to university and you study this, uh, I was there as an undergraduate and I saw it happen. It, it can really, oh my God, uh, as a Christian, uh, impact you quite uh, negatively. You think, well, what's the, this, this, this shouldn't be happening. <laughs> um, anyway, so I thought I'd share that with you. Um, until next time. I think what he said is quite true because with time as the meaning changes 
uh, Jesus has been elevated and that's where the problem comes in because people now are seeing the new version of Jesus that may not have been in the past and maybe not even in the original language. That's what the problem is. Translation is usually a very, very big problem. Maybe the people that were translating thought best to explain things as they saw them. Things that they thought this should be like this and not like this. So you interpret the passages according to your own uh, thoughts and needs and how you want to present something. Otherwise, this was very educational and very, very important. Many people should... Um, be willing to watch such videos so that they a, they um expand their knowledge and and understand things way better otherwise many times jesus has said he's not god but people christians decide to turn have decided to turn a blind eye to that let's question things in life questioning doesn't mean there's anything wrong sometimes questioning just opens you up to things that you could have not known otherwise this was amazing make sure to give this video a thumbs up share it with your friends and of course do not forget to subscribe and of course feel free to let me know what you think about this video and i'll see you next time